Okay, good afternoon. Thank you to all of you to join uh, the final webinar of the OptiTrack project. Um, today we will have a one hour webinar uh, during which uh, you will be able to um, ask questions using the chat room. Uh, so if you see uh, you are you have a, a chat um, possibility, uh, so please use that to ask your questions because we will not hear you. Uh, so I will uh, during the whole webinar uh, check the chat room, uh, take the question uh, in, and then um, uh, we will answer those questions at the end. So uh, let's start first uh, with uh, the agenda of uh, today's webinar. Just for your information, we had uh, in Brussels in uh, early July um, a final conference where we presented already our project um, and uh, we take now the opportunity of this webinar to present uh, some of our results. Um, and then uh, to inform you uh, about, uh, let's say, where you can find uh, all uh, these uh, material. So um, let's let's start now. Um, first, what is OptiTrack? OptiTrack uh, is uh, a project uh, that in his title says very clearly that we have developed uh, optimal fuel consumption with predictive powertrain control and calibration for intelligent track. So what is original in this project is that we have looked at how to bring ITS data together with uh, powertrain data in order to improve um, the powertrain uh, control um, staying within uh, Euro 6 emission standards, and this is for a heavy duty road haulage. Uh, the first target in the call was uh, to uh, realize about 20% of a reduction in fuel consumption. This uh, project started uh, three years ago. Um, and uh, is funded by the Commission under the Horizon 2020 program. Um, and he received uh, 4.55 million euro. Uh, the project partner, apart Ethico, as coordinator, we have two uh, industry partners, Ford Autosand and EAV uh, in Germany. Uh, then we have what we've called the user sector, so the users of, of tracks, which is Cadunotto in Italy, and uh, Iliadis, uh, which is an SME uh, track company in, um, in Greece, in Thessaloniki. And then we, had, uh, we have uh, six research and in innovation uh, sector, uh, so research organization with Albok University, um, ISMB, which is now a uh, Lynx um, um, organization in uh, foundation in uh, Turin, uh, CERT uh, from Thessaloniki, University of Leeds, ICOR in Italy, and Okan University in Istanbul. What is the global uh, concept and approach of uh, our uh, project? Is uh, to look on one side. Uh, at what data we have uh, ahead of the vehicle, but far ahead, so much wider, a much wider, longer distance than current track can really access, um, and uh, use uh, the information that we can get all along the, um, the, the route of the track in order to do the best estimation uh, with respect to uh, that will impact fuel consumption um, and and this is mainly uh, by estimating a speed profile uh, that will be esti estimated from the the cloud and sent to the track which will be then used by the track uh, in order to do his uh, own um, uh, optimization. So we will end up with a global optimization based on, on cloud optimization and onboard optimization. 
For this, we looked at the different mission uh, updates um, and um, uh, different mission, and um, we will uh, have we will have uh, demonstrated uh, during our project uh, these uh, these uh, development uh, in a demonstration route that we will come back later on. Um, the innovation in this project was uh, to uh, divide uh, our uh, development in 10 innovation elements, which are listed here. And for each of these innovation elements, we did an estimation of what will be the impact of these innovation when implemented. Um, we'll come back to that uh, later on when we will uh, look at uh, our simulation results. So the objective of the project, very briefly, uh, this was first to develop a track demonstrator to be tested in real environment. This is what we did. To develop the software component uh, that is uh, used by the cloud system in, in order to collect the different uh, data sources, uh, data from the different data sources. Um, then to carry out real environment trials with two demonstrators, and we'll come back all that also on that later on, uh, with a baseline track and with a track equipped uh, with our innovation. These were two tracks of the same kind following each other. Um, then we performed a validation and impact assessment. Uh, and finally, uh, we developed strategy for larger development of the proposed system. Right, so this was very, very brief. We don't have much time, so I think I already took more than four minutes. Should you have any question, please, uh, already you can put your question there. I will follow this up. Uh, now uh, we will give uh, the floor to uh, Jean Battista Fiume from ICOR. So, Jean Battista, you can uh, have your uh, presentation uh, ready and uh, we will switch to you. Hello to everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I switch my presentation. Presentation making. Yes. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Hello, I'm Gian Battista Fiume from ICOR, Poliba and Unity S. Uh, I will present the cloud-based optimizer. So, uh, first of all, I show my in the index of the presentation where I present briefly the architecture of the cloud system architecture. Then we uh, talk about uh, the pre-mission uh, phase and emission phase. So the architecture is, is this one. So uh, the part that uh, the cloud optimizer uh, will use is the weather services and map services. The weather services is provided by uh, Unity S. Then the map service is provided by PTBO. This is uh, the that is an external uh, service that uh, provides the maps, uh, the information about traffic, uh, and uh, all the information about the route. All of this data is going to go to the service data manager that is connected the, with the planning data manager. And uh, after all, uh, all of, the, of this data will go in the cloud optimizer manager that uh, do all the optimization for the route. So uh, we pass to the permission phase. Why we need a permission phase and emission phase? Because the permission phase, uh, um, that is the phase that uh, we calculate the echo route, so the route that uh, uh, requests less energy uh, is uh, time needed. Uh, so uh, we need some time to, uh, to do all the calculation. So uh, we have thought to use uh, um, the time uh, up, uh, before the, the mission to calculate all the things. How does it work? The echo route, uh, the echo route planner same is to calculate the best route. Uh, to calculate the best route, uh, we um, extract all the information from the uh, cloud optimizer man um, uh, with the cloud optimizer manager that is uh, connected to uh, the PDM. Uh, this information also included all the information that uh, PTB uh, give us and uh, 
this information are historical real-time traffic data and maps data, and uh, the real-time forecast information from uh, UNITS. So the aim of uh, this part is to calculate the best route that uh, optimizes the velocity profile and uh, uh, all of this information are sent to the driver before the mission begins. How does it work? So the fleet manager company sends the information to the, to the cloud and says uh, how much is the payload and which waypoint is, uh, are needed. So uh, using this information, we connect, uh, all, we ask to PTV to connect these waypoints and to give us uh, the fastest route. On the fastest route, we also uh, have the information about maneuvers. Maneuvers are, uh, uh, we can think uh, uh, in maneuvers as uh, the big uh, crossing roads. So using this information, uh, the, the location of this maneuver, we can connect uh, each maneuver to the waypoint, to the next waypoint. Of course, uh, uh, for the maneuver in this case, uh, one, two, and three, we're gonna ask to PTV to connect uh, the waypoint B, then all the, way, the maneuver after the waypoint B, we are gonna ask to PTV to connect only waypoint C. So in this way, we have created, uh, as we say, a root network. Now, uh, the information that we need is to uh, calculate the velocity profile that uh, um, consumes less uh, uh, fuel. To do this, um, we um, use the information that the PTV provide us. So uh, let's uh, see this image. Every uh, little point in this segment, the green segment, uh, is, a, is a point that has a longitude and latitude. So for each of these points, we uh, associate a set of speed profile, a set of velocity that goes from V1, that is the uh, slower velocity, that uh, it depends uh, from the, the kind of street. So for highway, we set uh, 60 kilometers per hour. Then to VN, that is the upper limit, it is provided by PTV with the, the uh, VCALC information. The VCALC takes in account the information about traffic. Uh, for the pre-mission, we use historical data. For the emission data, we use the real-time data. So for each of these points, we connect each state of velocity uh, with the, the next one, and we make uh, all the, co the possible combination. Now we need to calculate the energy to connect V1 for the point K and V1, V2 to uh, Vn from the point K uh, plus one. To do that, uh, we have used the, the vehicle longitudinal model that is provided by uh, Ford Autosan. Uh, in this model, we use the weather forecast information with wind information that give us the information about the direction of the wind and the intensity. Of course, uh, the PTV uh, VCALC, uh, uh, the velocity, the upper velocity, and then the road slopes. That is also a data provided by PTV. Once done, and this calculation, I'm sorry, uh, we have uh, calculated a root graph that is a weighted graph. So using uh, this weighted graph in the Dijkstra algorithm, we can calculate the, the echo root. Uh, that is the, the root with the less uh, fuel consuming, and we also provide the, the optimized velocity profile. Uh, I can, uh, in, in this uh, photo, uh, we, we can see how the root network is for the mission uh, Bari-Piacenza. We can see Bari in the, in the south of uh, east of the, of the photo. And the, the white lines are all the, the root network. So all this data are passed to the cloud optimizer and then are, uh, the green one is the echo root calculated. After uh, uh, the calculation of the echo root, we pass in the emission phase. The emission phase works practically as uh, the pre-emission phase, uh, but uh, now new data are considered. The first one is the track GPS coordinates, because when we ask information to PTV, we use uh, as a waypoint A, so the start waypoint, uh, the track uh, uh, actual uh, position. 
and the PTV give us the information about uh, the presence of uh, incidents, any congestion, or uh, we can ask to the uh, Unity S module if there are some uh, bad weather conditions. So, uh, why we need uh, the emission phase? Because if an accident occurs, uh, some, we, we can have some problem on this segment, the red segments. So, it's crucial to know uh, what to do before we reach the node that is uh, indicated by the arrow. To do this, uh, as we said, uh, the problem is to have the information and uh, uh, we need the time to calculate uh, the alternative route. To do this, uh, there are two models that work in symbiosis, that is the planning data manager and the predictor. Also because we need uh, uh, as much as less time uh, we decided to extract the nodes, the three nodes before uh, the accident and three nodes uh, after the accident. In this way, we can assure um, a fastest calculation and uh, uh, how does it work? So we have extracted these nodes. So we asked to PTPU to connect uh, each uh, node uh, before the, the accident to each uh, node after the accident. So we build a mini network. In this mini, uh, mini network, we ask all the information to the predictor to know all the information about uh, the, the traffic condition. After this, a mini graph is constructed and we send all this information to the optimizer that using the new weather data can calculate the new route, uh, the, the new route if it is needed. In this case, uh, we have uh, selected the new route uh, with the, the blue arrow. We have also um, an example. We asked uh, to PTV some information about the route uh, Bari Milano. And uh, as you can see, PTV give us the information that the near Foggia there is an accident and all the red uh, route is blocked. So we ask to PTV all the information. We have calculated, this is the yellow one, is the new uh, mini network, and then uh, a new alternative is constructed. The, the part of Cloud Optimizer finished and I pass uh, to Kerem Kapubasi that uh, is gonna uh, explain the powertrain optimization. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kerem Kilpavosha and I would like to explain uh, the work we did uh, briefly on the optimization of the powertrain control strategy um, in collaboration with IAV. Um, so I don't have currently access to the slides, unfortunately, but if you can pass me the control. Uh, hi, good morning, Kerem. This is Hugo Rubuk from Ertico. Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I will show my screen. Uh, so please hold for a second. And Kerem, uh, I will be very happy to change the slides as soon as you give me a cue. Just tell me next, and uh, I will be very happy to move on the slides uh, so that everyone can see. Okay, no problem. Um, so we can uh, go to the next slide, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the first slide shows the overall control system architecture that was developed specifically for the Opti truck project. These different colors, PCCM, RPU, and ECU, represent three different electronic control units, uh, which were either modified or new function, uh, new software functions were added to these control modules in the scope of the Opti truck project. The main idea here is to um, to adapt the control strategy, control system functionality according to the um, information received from the cloud optimizer uh, that describes um, the vehicle speed profile and the route profile ahead of the vehicle 
so that the powertrain can take um, more accurate decisions according to the knowledge of the horizon they have the vehicle. So the main input of the strategy um, from the perspective of the RPU is the, uh, the power and uh, distance arrays and set speed arrays received from the PCCM. And the main outputs to the engine control units are the coolant temperature set points and the engine operating mode. And you can see a number of different sub-blocks that, that correspond to various functionalities developed by Ford Utasan or IAV. So I'll try to detail some of these components. We don't have time to go through all of these components in detail. So uh, the next slide, uh, please, we'll go through the description um, of the virtual ECU and engine models that were implemented on the rapid prototyping unit that communicates with the engine control unit via a real-time bypass interface. Um, as you can see on the right-hand side, the virtual ECU model uh, is essentially a detailed model of fuel air set point structure of the diesel engine control unit. And the right-hand side, we have developed two different models to represent the engine combustion process. The first one is the Gaussian process model that was used for more detailed simulation studies. And the second one is a polynomial-based model that's a fairly accurate representation of the more sophisticated model. And this was used for real-time implementation on the RPU. And on the bottom, you can see also a comparison of these two models uh, for two different engine operating modes, abbreviated as EOM0 or EOM4. And you can see in terms of predicting the engine out NOx emissions, uh, both models are fairly effective and that the polynomial model could be used uh, for the real-time implementation inside the vehicle. So next, please. Uh, another component that was developed in this project by IAV uh, primarily was the cooling system uh, optimizer. The main purpose of this to, to reduce to the cooling fan energy demand and this was tested in the OptiTruck simulation environment primarily. It was concluded that the optimizer works well in simulation. As you can see that the red uh, traces have been reduced uh, to the blue traces in terms of the energy demand of the cooling fan. And the overall energy, cumulative energy demand has been reduced significantly in simulation. Uh, however, the fan energy demand in a cumulative fashion is relatively low compared to the overall energy out of the engine. So its impact on fuel consumption uh, has been found low, um, I would say lower than 1% in this particular simulation case. Uh, next, please. Uh, the emissions coordinator, the EC function, was another function developed by IEV, and its main purpose is to regulate the emissions conformity factor such that Euro 6 level emissions can be maintained while the CO2 emissions or the fuel consumption uh, could be also optimized uh, with respect to the, the driving conditions. Uh, this strategy uses uh, multiple operating modes and a predictive strategy to switch between these operating modes, which in this case are mainly the catalyst heating mode and the normal operating mode. There is also a hysteresis band introduced uh, to avoid path switching between engine operating modes. Uh, next, please. Uh, another critical component of the overall system that was developed by Ford Utasan uh, is the horizon data processing element. This is essentially decomposed into two subcomponents: the provider component and the reconstructor component. The main function of the provider component is to pack the prediction arrays in, uh, uh, received from the cloud into CAN messages in a, uh, in a specific format and then transmit them to the RPU. And this component has been implemented on what we call the PCCM module. The data reconstructor, on the other hand, uh, does a similar functionality. It was implemented 
uh, on the RPU to, to unpack these CAN messages and reconstruct the predicted vehicle speed and wheel power arrays uh, for use in the downstream functionality. Uh, and there's also another function called the speed and torque trace generator, which transforms the prediction arrays into predicted engine speed and predicted engine torque traces using a simplified transmission model. And the, ultimately, the outputs of this component feeds uh, the previous components that I described, which are mainly the uh, emissions coordinator and the en energy flow coordinator for making the final decisions on uh, the set points that are fed to the engine control unit. So next, please. Um, so after describing some of the fundamental components of the control system developed for Opti truck, I'd like to quickly mention the hardware in the loop uh, system setup that was used for the testing of this overall system. This system uh, has proved to be particularly beneficial prior to vehicle testing. It includes the actual hardware from three different components, as you can see in this diagram, the PCCM, the ECU, and the RPU. Uh, the main purpose of this uh, kill system that was, uh, that was prepared in Ford Autos on premises was to um, permit real-world testing using also a GNSS simulator to emulate the GPS signals uh, required during the this this test scenario, excuse me. And it allows causal testing of any type of real world scenario using realistic map data. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this slide shows that the hardware in the load simulation test bed is uh, sufficiently representative of the actual driving conditions. So we've, include, we've included two different graphs that show the uh, comparison of hill simulation results and the actual vehicle test results in terms of cumulative fuel flow and cumulative engine out NOx emissions. You can see that uh, the test scenario that was conducted over 50 kilometer road segment was sufficiently uh, representative uh, of the actual vehicle behavior so that the control system could use this environment as a validation test bed uh, prior to vehicle testing. So next, please. Uh, just one uh, simple example of how we use the setup for uh, troubleshooting and software testing purposes. Uh, this is an example hill test results uh, from the testing of the cloud PCCM interface, communication interface. Um, you can see, for instance, two graphs on this slide. The first graph shows a root, root transmission issue that was identified during hill testing. There is a particular jump scenario here that was then corrected. Uh, the necessary software corrective actions were taken and the route was re-simulated. And on the right-hand side, you can see that the retest uh, was successful. It showed proper data transmission and interpretation. Uh, so these type of uh, troubleshooting scenarios uh, have proven that the hill test setup was particularly beneficial in the scope of the OptiChuck project. So that was my last slide. Uh, we will continue with the demonstration route and validation that Dimitri will take over at this point. Thank you very much, Karim. Dimitri uh, will be our next speaker. Uh, I have now uh, passed on control to him. So uh, I will ensure that you can speak. Hello, Dimitri, you can you can speak. Uh, the floor yes. is yours. Great, I think you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please okay, go ahead. Great. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon or whatever your time zone is. Good morning. Um, I will... Uh, present you a few things regarding the validation. You know, the time frame is really uh, narrow. And also, Kerem, please, Hugo, if you can uh, keep uh, uh, unmuted um, 
Kerem, in order to intervene with the, for the last three slides, so, or also whatever, whenever it is needed during the presentation, because the validation was done by Ford. It was the only way, actually, because they handled the vehicles and uh, um, the whole uh, measuring equipment. I try to go to the next slide. Yes. So the aim of the validation was to evaluate the impact of a system in terms of fuel consumption. The main objectives of this activity was to test within a, a common way all the project development developments through the subjective and objective evaluation tools. With uh, subjective, we mean the uh, questionnaires or other surveys, and for the objective, uh, we're talking about the data logger data and also uh, GPS data, so the hard figures. Uh, regarding also the another objective was the to optimize, to test and optimize the um, develop functionalities and all the other systems or algorithm, algorithms that we developed uh, during the project. And of course, to verify the system functionality, usefulness and usability. So to look also into the driver and how they perceive the whole experience of uh, the long duration test that we performed. Uh, we, I will explain, I will split this um, uh, presentation into two. Uh, parts. One is the national part, the national test part, and the international. So a few slides regarding the method, the vehicles that we used, and actually Ford, uh, was the a 2019 Ford F-Max uh, truck, a tractor. Uh, this tractor was voted as the tractor of the year in, uh, I think, September, October 2018. So it was the most recent truck, and also maybe in the market. Uh, both vehicles had a, a horsepower of 50, uh, 500 uh, PS, diesel engines, of course, with a 12-speed transmission. Uh, the gross vehicle could be up to 42 tons, and the, the load for the national test was uh, concrete slabs uh, that were placed in the construction type uh, trailer. You might also see at the right uh, picture, it was a trailer for construction for both vehicles, of course. So, in the, as um, 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 John Charles explained at the beginning, one truck was the reference truck, so a truck without the, any system, or it was just as, as sold in the market, and the other one was equipped uh, with the OptiTruck system. Uh, regarding the route, uh, for the national route, we, we conducted three, uh, two days, uh, the test on you know, July the 3rd and 4th, uh, you might see that the test phase was a little bit compressed because we had to delay the development of the system. So then we postponed the test. The actual plan was to have it a little bit earlier, the national route, in order to 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 see or to identify issues that could be solved, and then to run the long uh, test, uh, the international test. However, we squeezed it so you will see the dates are both test the national and the international, the month July. So the test took place between the premises of uh, Ford in uh, Turkey, close to Istanbul. Uh, the same mission conducted twice, so the, in the, the same date. So actually four times it was uh, go and uh, return uh, trip. Uh, approximately the one direction took five hours and the complete national route was approximately 260 kilometers. So this was per day, the 206 kilometers. Uh, regarding the data, uh, the route has been divided into segments. Uh, the, some segments were, were disregarded because of the uh, driver activation of the system. You see the system at the right picture, the right side picture. Uh, if the driver uh, did not activate it or it was not possible to use the, the, the uh, let's say, distractions because of the traffic or other, other um, problems, so this segment was disregard, uh, discarded. The numerical results provided three row segments that could have an interrupted um, usage of the system, of the OptiTrack system. And these three segments were used then as a next step for the, cons for the comparison of the uh, fuel economy, fuel um, consumption and the NOx emission. And for the complete route with the comparison of vehicle speed for the OptiTrack and the, the uh, equipped with a system and the reference, and also the vehicle weight. And also, you see, you see at the left side the three segments uh, through the complete um, route. Now, regarding the international um, demo, 
the, the whole logistics where um, FBN, let's say, appointed to the CDA uh, company, it, it's a, a Turkish company, in, uh, of course, in cooperation with, uh, with Ford. The loading and unloading locations were in, um, in Italy, provided by Condognoto, one of the partners of this project. The, let's say a big success that uh, companies, brand names like IKEA and Electrolux were convinced to transport their goods uh, during this validation process. And uh, so IKEA uh, goods were transported from Turkey to Italy. It, it, it was about 26 tons. And Electrolux goods from Italy to Turkey, the return trip, it was approximately the same weight, 24 uh, tons. For both trucks, okay, with a small deviation point between one truck and the other truck, you know, okay, the pallets couldn't be exactly the same weight, but the, the weight was pretty co uh, comparable for both trucks. Uh, the international test took place between July 18th and July 30, 30th. So going to Italy from uh, Turkey, you see the map, uh, crossing, going actually through the north, north, northern part of, of Greece. And then from the port of Igumenica in Greece, uh, moved by boat to Bari, another central um, port in Italy, and then moved uh, towards uh, Piacenza, where was the one unloading uh, point for IKEA, and then uh, loading the new load, the, the goods from Electrolux, from Portia, and then doing the same trip, but uh, the way back. And ending, of course, in... Uh, in um, uh, at, in Turkey, close to Istanbul. Um, we followed again the same way of analyzing the data. The only difference was that uh, the first uh, part of the analysis um, con concerned the, it, it was ki a kind of daily split, a daily segmentation. So after that, uh, we followed the same process of uh, usable and non usable data, then uh, um, synchronized the usable data. Uh, with the GPS uh, coordinates in order to have comparable, uh, to compare the one track um, uh, route and the other track at the same point. So to compare the fuel and the NOx emissions, but uh, for the same segment. Um, three segments were identified for this uh, job, not very long, but uh, at these three segments, the system was uh, on. So, so, um, we used by the, the driver, and again we compared uh, the NOx emission fuel, fuel economy, and but for the whole route, the vehicle speed and the vehicle weight. So I think now Kerem can continue with the results because it was the person that uh, did the, the, this process of the data. Please, Kerem. Yeah, well, uh, thank you, Dimitri. So I, I will just say a few words in the last uh, part of this demonstration uh, presentation. So as Dimitri just mentioned, we've actually segmented the data both for the national route and international route into mini segments and tried to analyze those mini segments. Um, I would say in summary that uh, the results were not uh, entirely conclusive uh, from our standpoint because we have seen results where the demo vehicle uh, achieved better fuel economy compared to the baseline vehicle. Uh, we have also seen the opposite, in which the, uh, the baseline vehicle resulted in better fuel economy. Uh, and we've also seen sections in which the fuel economies were more or less um, comparable or identical. So I'll, just for uh, graphical illustration purposes, I'd like to show two uh, different test results. And I'll explain uh, with a couple of uh, our uh, conclusions, let me say, as to why the results were not uh, fully conclusive. So in this segment, for instance, was uh, one, in, one in which the demo vehicle actually um, generated more fuel consumption compared to the reference vehicle. On the right-hand side, you can see that the vehicle speed traces followed by the reference vehicle and the demo vehicle. Uh, the demo vehicle used a specific a cruise control strategy that mainly relied on the speed set point profiles uh, transmitted by the cloud optimizer algorithm. Uh, one of the main issues that we've seen throughout the demonstration phase was the, um, I would say, inaccuracy, unexpected inaccuracy of the slope data that was used. Uh, as you can see at the bottom, 
the there's a comparison of the slope data coming from three different sources. Uh, we have plotted uh, PT slopes against uh, slope from here map of the data source, also the pitch angle sensor data from the demonstration vehicle. You can see that the red and blue traces are fairly similar to each other except uh, a bias factor encountered in the pitch angle sensor. But the PTV slope for this particular road segment was very, very noisy, and it also negatively contributed to the speed optimization done in the cloud, which in this case is also um, generated, uh, in our opinion, uh, worse fuel economy compared to the baseline example, baseline truck, I'm sorry. So next slide, uh, this was the national route, just the segment, on, uh, let me say of the national route, uh, and an international route segment example, uh, which, which is much shorter in distance, about two and a half kilometers. In this case, the fuel economies are comparable. Uh, actually, the demo vehicle is just slightly lower than the reference vehicle. Uh, but again, in, in this case, uh, we think that this may be uh, a merely a coincidence of the test conditions, uh, which are not exactly comparable between the reference vehicle and the demo vehicle. You can see, again, a similar comparison of the slope data sources. Uh, there are large differences uh, in uh, reference to the expectation when you look at the PTV as the slope data source uh, is not in alignment with the two other data sources, unfortunately. And other segment results are also similar to these. So we can maybe conclude saying that uh, in the next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, the fuel coming emissions test results were not entirely conclusive in terms of assessing the performance of the OPTI truck system. There will be further slides uh, on the simulation results, which we think are uh, more representative of the actual scenario with accurate slope information. Uh, another finding, uh, let me say, was the significant differences observed in driver behavior. Uh, the national test was conducted by professional test drivers, uh, whereas the international test, uh, because of a number of reasons, uh, were conducted by um, drivers that are not professional test drivers. And so, but although the same driving instructions were given to both sets of drivers, the international test drivers uh, uh, failed to closely follow these instructions during the international mission. And uh, as a result of the interview with the, one of the drivers from the international mission, the key contributor to the uh, lack of acceptance of instructions were uh, the guidance, uh, the inaccurate map data guidance, uh, which have uh, resulted in large fluctuations in vehicle speed. Uh, so we've actually seen that the OptiTruck system was disabled very frequently during the international test. Uh, and as a result, the demonstration results were negatively impacted for this uh, specific demonstration route. So I think this is the end of the demonstration section. We will continue with the simulation results and Engin will take over. Thank you very much, Karim. Uh, Engin, I will now pass on the microphone and the screen to you. Uh, is this all right? Uh, I'll take that as a yes. You will now be made our presenter for the next step. Please, uh, you have the floor now. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Uh, we have on the screen a two tables, gray and green uh, simulation results. There we go. I think we have your presentation now. Uh, yes, we can hear you and we can see your presentation. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. This is Engin from Okan University. And today I will talk about the vehicle simulation environment and then how we use this environment to um, for scale up purposes mainly. Basically, what we have done is we tried to develop the digital twin of the actual truck. And for that, a comp the very complex models have been developed. 
and this is the overview of the vehicle simulation environment. It does not, of course, simulate the cloud system, or um, I mean, it has it has it does not simulate the traffic, but it takes those values as input to the uh, simulation environment. So what we have done, we have used the MATLAB simulation environment and GT power based models. So these are you these models or or these. Um, softwares are used to develop the complex models of the actual truck and in addition to that we use the truck maker so, uh, software for uh, surrounding vehicle modeling and how we uh, basically we, we, we develop uh, or designed the, the soft sensors to realize the surrounding vehicles and we have developed a scenario generation tool for testing various various scenarios and we have also integrated third party data providers to our simulation environment uh, i mean like the for for road grade we uh, use the here map data to simulate the the um, road grade profile that has been uh, produced or replaced i mean we, we are we we replay the data recorded from the real world testing, and for that we use the HIMAX data for, to, to get the road grade data. So um, this is a collaborative project, so that's why we had to work collaboratively. Uh, we used the GitHub server for the version control system, and we have used the reference models in MATLAB simulating environment. And by using this way, we have divided all the project into sub modules. And then each partner uh, worked on their own component. And then uh, this basically the um, working with the, the with GitHub and with different branch structure lead us to work collaboratively. And everyone every time when a developer has pushed their updates to the GitHub server, this information was sent to the Ocon servers. And then the Ocon servers were uh, automatically pulling the data from the GitHub server and merging all the new updates and deploying the new version of the software so by this way uh, we could work collaboratively and without blocking any i mean without blocking uh, any other developers and so it was an efficient way of working so this is the overview of the simulation system in the simulating environment so as you can see we have here five uh, modules I mean, the first one is data bus. The second one is the abstract control system, the cloud system, the environment, and the actual truck. So these are the main modules, and under underneath them we have the sub modules. For example, on the bottom figure you can see the sub modules for, uh, that's composing of the the truck module. So we have the brake control unit, the driver models, engine control unit, engine module. Uh, transmission control unit, transmission model, vehicle model, and these are all the sub modules for the truck. So, I mean, all the data or all the uh, simulating models that are developed are are distinct from each other. And this was also a way representing how we worked and uh, in a collaborative manner, because I mean, since we could differentiate all the sub modules and every partner was developing different part of the. Uh, the, the modules, it was possible to collaborate and work efficiently. And this is the simulation scenario generation tool. Basically, uh, by using this tool, we, I mean, we were able to generate different scenarios. So one way of doing, I mean, one way of generating scenario is you from the map. Basically, we can define the start and destination points. And then by using uh, third party data providers, we were calculating, we were getting a route information. And uh, on the right hand side, we had several options. The first one is the road grade option. Either we could uh, feed the simulation system with a constant grade, or we could uh, apply some sinusoidal grade, or we could get the data from cloud, or we could just feed the data for this road uh, just from the file just reading the road grade from an Excel file. The same uh, is valid for the wind speed, but of course wind speed, we didn't have any data from the cloud or, or we didn't have recorded any data. So basically either the constant value or the sinusoidal value was used for scenario generation. Again, for reference speed profile, uh, we had option for the this uh, just using for NADC cycle or we could provide constant speed or signal speed, or it was or, or it was also possible to read the data or replay data from the real-world test recordings. 
So the simulation system validation, actually in the previous section, I mean, this the hill simulations, the, the validation of the hill simulations are, and the actual test results were discussed. And here some uh, the results for, for the validation of the simulation system. On the left side, basically, this is the route that is uh, for the national test. And uh, on the right side, you see the road grade profile. And, uh, and basically here we see the comparison of the uh, the results that have been collected from the simulation system and from the actual vehicle. The blue curve uh, represents the simulated vehicle and the red curve represents the real vehicle, the, the real data collected from the vehicle. And on the uh, left top plot basically shows the difference of the speed profile, so they are pretty close. And on the right hand side, uh, the top right side we see the cumulative engine power it's also very close the values are very close to each other indeed the cumulative value difference is, is less than 0.5 percent and there are some representative other values for the boost pressure and selective catalytic reduction temperature and on the next slide we have the comparison of the cumulative fuel consumption the cumulative urea dosage the engine NOx emissions and exhaust temperature these values are all normalized values, but when you see, when you look at the the uh, end results of the cumulative values, so the, they are in the range of two percent, so it was acceptable for our expectation. And the next one is basically uh, is running the simulation by using the optimal speed profile and comparing it with the actual uh, driven speed profile. So what we have here is uh, from the national test, we have the, the blue curve is the driven speed profile. And around that speed profile, we were able to create some speed bands. And within that speed bands, we have calculated the optimal speed profiles. And then we see what we could achieve with, the, with this optimal speed profile. And here uh, on the right-hand side, we have the significant, significant, significant uh, the, the values are a little bit uh, highlighted here and we see that when the road grade is increasing our optimal speed which is shown by red curve on the right side is slowing down and it, it starts from the the uh, maximum speed limit and when we reach to the end of the uh, steep the uh, positive grade basically our speed profile reaches to the uh, minimum speed limit and just the opposite action is taking place when uh, we are going downhill so we start at the minimum speed at 0.2 and then by going to by at the end of the uh, downhill we see that at 0.3 our speed is reaches to the maximum speed limit so basically based on the road grade data the optimal speed is fluctuating from minimum to the maximum speed that we give by the with the speed bands that we have defined. And this is the result from the international test. Again, we take the uh, driven speed profile and around the driven speed profile, we have generated the positive, the maximum and the minimum speed limits. And within that speed bands, we have we uh, calculate the optimum speed profile. And the comparison results in this case shows that uh, we have an improvement of 7.7%. And this leads to, however, uh, a dec I mean, uh, a, the time of arrival is increased by 5.6%. So there is a, a trade-off here. I mean, when we gain 7.7 7, uh, in fuel economy, we lose. I mean, we arrive 5.6% uh, less. I mean, later than the original arrival time. And by using the simulation system we actually simulated various scenarios for each innovation elements on the left side you can see the improvements for each innovation element however uh, these innovation elements are not um, actually i mean possible to achieve in the actual transport mission because uh, not all the innovation elements are taking uh, place in along all the routes so for example if we look at the innovation element eight this is just considering the one taking over event 
about how many times a truck in its during a one mission, how many taking over it will take place is, I mean, it is really depending on the traffic conditions that we cannot uh, determine, I mean, I mean, there is not, not a, a specific number for that. So basically these are the just improvements for each case, but on the right hand side, we did some assumptions and then based on the assumptions, we generate, we created a total saving percentage that, that we could achieve uh, by using each innovation element. For example, uh, for the first innovation element, which is the value profile optimization, we can achieve uh, around, uh, I mean, 10% improvement. And um, <clears throat> for example, with the direct, I mean, correct parameter estimation, we assume that this can be applicable for 300 kilometers out of 2,400 kilometers. So we calculate a value for this range and for taking over for platooning, I mean, we have assumed some values along which these uh, actions will take place and we have calculated some values and based on the, our assumptions in total in simulation system we we, we said that we have 11.4 percent improvement in the i mean the potential is calculated as this value but these are all based on our assumptions and that's all from my side Thank you very much, Engin. Um, uh, our next speaker is Haibo Chen. Uh, I will now, uh, Haibo, I can see you're connected. So I will now make you the presenter. Uh, you are now our presenter and you have, you should have the microphone, Haibo. So uh, please, the floor is yours. See. Screen. Can you see my screen? Uh, no, we cannot see your screen just yet. Uh, we can hear you though. Uh, let me see. <laughs> uh, let me see. It, okay, it I have. Is, uh, it is the one. Uh, I chose the. I chose the. No, you can't see my yeah, screen. Okay. Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Good. Good. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, I just, uh, yeah, I don't know uh, how many minutes left for me to go through, um, but I just uh, give you um, the overview of the uh, Obity truck approach for impact uh, uh, scaling up. Um, okay. Yeah, um, you have heard that uh, 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 Karen uh, talked about uh, on board system and uh, Angin talking about uh, here uh, the uh, vehicle model on the right side and uh, in this project actually we looked at uh, different models at different levels of course so the, these models uh, have a different requirement for data quality details frequency and also uh, produce uh, different uh, accuracies as well. So what can we do for this uh, uh, impact assessment and uh, scaling up of the uh, uh, innovation uh, elements developed in this project? Who uh, we developed these models for? Uh, obviously, on the red side, um, you probably think about the OEMs. On the very, very uh, uh, left end side, you probably think about the decision makers or governmental officers who would uh, uh, wouldn't need or wouldn't be able to get a detailed. Uh, um, uh, you know, the parameters from vehicle operations and so on. So that is why we thought that uh, we could look at uh, all these uh, different categories and they came up with uh, something useful for different stakeholders. So um, because of time, I, I, I would be able to uh, go through all this uh, development of these uh, models. So I decided to select uh, the one on the, uh, well, the two, um, highlighted uh, on this slide. So one is a, a, a simpler uh, Simulink um, uh, vehicle model uh, than the you know hardware in the loop uh, vehicle model and then another one is a very very uh, simple uh, gradient based uh, view uh, model. Um, first of all um, just to give you the idea of what uh, a Simulink uh, simulation model can do uh, you, you probably already heard uh, um, from 
current supplementation, um, the vehicle model uh, consists of a lot of uh, components. But what is important is uh, whether or not this model can be calibrated properly against the real data. So I would like to uh, draw your uh, attention to this uh, the left diagram so showing uh, one uh, the black one in the, uh, in the background is the uh, real data collected uh, from this uh, uh, th demonstrations and then uh, on the top of that is the red one is a simulated results and uh, at the bottom part you can see how these two uh, data sets uh, uh, correlated with each other. Um, so that is the uh, start point. Of course, the more we do the uh, calib uh, the calibration, the better the model could be in terms of the fuel consumption estimation uh, to the uh, real values. Um, the, the Another issue I would like to say why we need this model is because uh, um, this uh, Simulink model is uh, 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 coupled with a, a traffic, a microscopic traffic model uh, supported by neural network uh, for uh, you know the uh, traffic prediction and so on. So bring all these uh, advances together, we are hoping that uh, the the model can uh, um, do uh, a good uh, uh, prediction for real situation. So what we did is we have a a different uh, user cases. So this is the one that we chose as a, as a part of the international, the original uh, plan for the international trials. So um, what you can see here is a, a one speed profile for baseline truck or reference truck, another uh, simulation, the uh, simulated uh, speed profile uh, due to the um, uh, optimizer. So what uh, really I want to show you is how this uh, two uh, models uh, differ from each other for different uh, traffic conditions. So this is uh, the two typical traffic conditions we're talking about, you know, the uh, st uh, normal traffic conditions and then the congested traffic conditions. The, well, overall, really, um, the uh, model predictive will control this uh, algorithm uh, outperformed and the uh, reference truck uh, all the time, and uh, the fuel consumption saved, uh, highlighted in this red, but uh, there are huge uh, gaps in the middle due to um, uh, the driving behaviors and other factors. Um, so that is the uh, sort of simulated uh, uh, traffic condition. So how about the real traffic condition? We know that uh, the international demonstration went through these routes and we know that uh, the fuel consumption produced uh, by reference uh, truck on this road and also their speed profiles. So what uh, we did is uh, we look at the same road and the same dates and the same traffic and then uh, compare, uh, you know, plot their uh, altitude of this road together with the real uh, speed profiles from the reference truck. Then uh, we optimize this uh, uh, section and uh, produce the optimized speed profiles and then uh, uh, well, of course, uh, calibrate uh, the models again and again against uh, the real data from this uh, reference truck. And uh, the, our, game, uh, our aim is to make sure that uh, the results uh, can be compared to each other because uh, obviously, if you want to save a fuel, you can drive at the low speed, that's for sure. Okay, but that is an unfair uh, comparison. So what we did is uh, we make sure that uh, these two trucks um, did the same uh, travel distance, um, uh, did a, a similar um, average speed, therefore the, arrived, the, the left and the arrived uh, the locations um, at the same time. So for that, so what is their behavior? So you can see that uh, um, the uh, optimized speed profiles have uh, gentle uh, accelerations, decelerations, therefore the leading to uh, fuel consumption of uh, by 3.68 percent. I, I would like to mention that uh, this is uh, consistent with what uh, uh, Anken said earlier. This uh, our model at least is only compared to the reference uh, truck. We didn't have, we don't have um, the other innovation elements um, simulated in our model. So, um, 
why, why do we need to? Uh, why do we need uh, other models uh, um, for impact assessment and scaling up? So, as you can see, that uh, this uh, vehicle models uh, demand uh, so many details about the data, about the parameters, about uh, uh, the simulation settings. So. If you look at uh, um, a specific short distance of the road, fine. But if you look at the European motorways, perhaps you need a lot of computers work together to give you some results. By the way, the uh, aggregating this uh, instantaneous data could sometimes depend how you did it. You did it accumulate uh, model errors as well. So for many many users, uh, stakeholders, that that kind of the models um, may be a little bit too much for them to do. So what can we do with it? So we first of all we just look at the um, uh, road slope and then the fuel consumption. See whether they have a relationship. This is a real data. As you can see, they correlated very very well. And with this two point really is the beginning of the trip and then the end of the uh, journey. But uh, if, if we focus on the motorways in the middle, it's really follow this uh, curve very well, indicating that uh, if we use uh, road slopes uh, along, the estimation of a few consumptions uh, the average rate wouldn't be miles away from a typical or from the uh, mean value. So what, 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 what can we do with this uh, simple model? First of all, we look at the international rules and then come up with uh, different road uh, categories according to the slopes and uh, curvature and then divide this road into all these uh, uh, classes because we, we, on the other hand, we have a uh, real data collected from this road as well. So we um, find the uh, representative of fuel uh, rates for these classes. And then we do the uh, road segmentation for other uh, European motorways like uh, uh, 10 uh, corridors and then uh, uh, apply this uh, uh, fuel rates to the roads. So we are doing that. We haven't finished this work yet. But at the end of the day, what we are hoping to have is a interactive map like this one. Uh, you can zoom in to you can zoom out to see the uh, whole the how uh, the orbit truck uh, innovation element contributed to the fuel consumptions for European motorways. If you zoom in, you can see how the roads uh, and other traffic conditions impact on the fuel consumption, and also you can look at. Uh, the local weather conditions as, as well. So this is what we are hoping to produce in an interactive map for impact assessment and scaling up from this project. And uh, luckily enough, we have another new project funded called the Modelis to look at uh, the savings in fuel, in, not in fuel, I mean, sorry, in the vehicle emissions, but uh, fuel uh, uh, consumption and emissions should go side by side, not uh, separately or operatively and so on. So we will carry on this uh, um, uh, work uh, into the new project. And um, if you wanted to find uh, uh, further the details of these models, and then we produce uh, quite uh, a few uh, uh, journal papers, conference papers from this project, and uh, these papers will be available uh, very soon online. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Haibo. Uh, we are now uh, reaching the, um, the last segment of our webinar, and without further ado, I will give the floor back to uh, Jean-Charles Pandazis, Project Coordinator for Optitruck, who will uh, give us the conclusions. Very good. Okay. So thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, Yes, we are uh, a little bit uh, behind schedule. Hopefully you are still uh, with us. Um, and uh, now uh, I would like to bring some conclusion about uh, the work that we have done in this project. Right. Oh. So, all right, it's better like this. So, in fact, uh, as you have just seen uh, with uh, the demonstration, I mean, the, the simulation uh, is that in our project, somehow we have demonstrated uh, the potential 
of reducing fuel consumption by an average of about 11 to 6 percent, um, which is, uh, I think, uh, a good result against the 20 percent that uh, was in the call. Uh, in the call, it was not written if these uh, 20 percent should have been uh, on the spot or in average uh, during the whole mission. Uh, this was not uh, clear. Uh, we have seen that some of our innovation element, uh, they were uh, working somehow uh, all the time and others were working uh, on the spot, uh, like if you want to overtake or things like this. This is uh, things that uh, are not uh, during the whole uh, duration of uh, the trip. Uh, so this is one thing. Then we also have seen that the quality of the cloud data, I mean, I shouldn't say the cloud data, but the, uh, let's say the data coming uh, from um, the, uh, for example, from the map uh, very uh, much ahead uh, is very important, uh, like slope data, uh, traffic data, uh, weather data, uh, in order to achieve a good uh, accuracy uh, of uh, the uh, estimated uh, speed that is uh, proposed by, by the cloud uh, system to the track. Um, so then the results uh, finally were obtained uh, mainly by our calibrated simulation uh, as we, as you have seen that with the real demonstrated we have faced this uh, data quality issue and driver unacceptance but this is, was also the challenge of our project is not just to do uh, let's say uh, measurement and test uh, with, uh, let's say, uh, on 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 uh, on the closed road, but also in with real mission, um, with the real customer, and this was, I think, for such a project, really a big big challenge um, that uh, we have faced. Um, the other thing uh, that is important also to mention is that the result and the development that have been made uh, in this project will be included by Ford Orderson uh, in the future track uh, as they target to enter uh, the European market uh, with this new track uh, within five years, by three to five years, right? So I think this is also an important uh, uh, result of this project. Uh, and then uh, next we discuss also at our uh, conference uh, in July about the fact that uh, we should also uh, maybe introduce eco-innovation for tracks as it is now existing for, um, I would say, cars in Europe. Uh, and this is a subject that will be brought forward uh, in the future. Um, why? Oh, sorry. Uh, so if I look now at the lessons learned somehow, uh, it is related to, and I think this is important to have that after such a project, uh, the importance of the ITS data services and map data quality has a direct, have a direct impact on the usability of the developed solution. Uh, then the algorithm strategy and flexibility versus ITS data. I think we need, of course, in the final product to have uh, established a strategy, um, alternative solution in case of we have these uh, pure uh, data quality or we have a low confidence level of the data coming uh, from, uh, let's say, the, the, uh, the cloud. Um, and then finally, uh, the track driver is really a very important uh, a part. Um, although we know that most of the time when you have such an application uh, working or a system working, it is on the motorway a situation where normally uh, you have uh, an intelligent cruise control system uh, that will uh, uh, be used. Uh, so the longitudinal control will be automated, but in many situations it can be uh, that the driver take over and in that situation or, or when uh, on the motorway you cannot apply your system uh, then the track, track driver is taking over and then uh, he needs to be uh, well uh, informed about um, about uh, what he has to do uh, and in case in in uh, on the motorway uh, he doesn't understand really why the system suddenly uh, is lowering this the, 
the, the speed and so on. Uh, there are good reason. Oh. Sir, we seem to have a slight sound issue. Uh, Joshua, can you speak again, please? Okay. Yes. Well, Sandy, uh, okay, the lessons learned you, gave, you could have seen. I can't hear anything. Um, for our kind attendees, there might be a problem with uh, the coordinator in Brussels. So maybe you you can wait a few minutes until the discussion. Um, let's see the conclusion of this webinar. Ah, now I see audio connection restored. Okay, very sorry for all this. Um, right. So, thank you very much. And I think uh, we will uh, we will close uh, the webinar now. Okay, thank you, and bye bye. Okay, thank you very much. Sure, thank sure. you to all the speakers as well, of course. <laughs> Cheers. Bye. Bye bye.